A few videos back, I had a look at the Feihao HDMI Mega Drive clone, and during that review I mentioned the At Games Mega Drive, and how I'd heard the controllers weren't as responsive as perhaps they should be. I heard there were some issues with the At Games system, well, quite a lot of issues to be fair. The thing is, I've never used the At Games Mega Drive flashback, I was just relying on what I'd heard on the Grapevine, and given the Grapevine isn't always entirely accurate, I thought I'd take a look myself. So here it is, the At Games Sega Mega Drive flashback HD. The question is, does this box contain a world of wonder, or a world of pain? In terms of style, the packaging is very similar to this previous At Games contraption. The Reactor Wireless Gaming Console, an earlier attempt at pushing out a Sega licensed incarnation. It looks a lot like a Wii, even down to a pair of dubious motion controllers, but in a far cheaper and shoddy package. The whole console is based around a Firecore Titan ARM CPU, as far as I can tell anyway, there have been many different models. This enables it to both emulate Sega Mega Drive games and run these additional motion sensitive titles. Clearly this version can't accept Mega Drive cartridges, you just get what's built in. At Games also released classic Genesis and Mega Drive models that could load most cartridges, excluding titles like Virtua Racing and EverDrive Karts. This version also appears to have been a Genesis on a chip implementation. But regardless, this time we're back to emulation. This new HD console can take cartridges. Whilst also sporting an impressive 85 titles, wireless pads and naturally HDMI. At Games have also now licensed the Mega Drive's appearance, so this console looks decidedly more Mega Drive Genesis y than their previous offerings. Inside the box, for which I paid a princely £79.99, we have an instruction sheet, the console, two wireless pads, an HDMI cable, and a power supply. This thing isn't tiny like the SNES Mini, by the way. Side by side you can see that it's still a reasonably bulky unit, although still smaller than an original Mega Drive. The controllers are very, very similar to the ones bundled with my Feihao Mega Drive, and feel just as shoddy. If you're looking for points out of a box, the SNES Mini is in a completely different league to this. If you hold an SNES Mini, it feels solid, dependable and tactile. This just feels like a slab of cheap plastic chucked together with some bargain basement pads, and that's pretty much what it is. Ok, let's plug it in. Pretty simple. One plug for the HDMI and one for power... Whoa, wait a minute, why is that power light on? Hmm, apparently the HDMI lead provides enough power to make the LED glow when the unit is turned off. Interesting design choice. Of course, this machine has its own power supply, unlike the SNES Mini with its fangled USB power straight to your TV. But I actually quite like a good old fashioned power supply, and I would have appreciated it if Nintendo had provided a USB wall adapter with their Mini. I'm going to plug a standard Mega Drive pad in to begin with. I think it's a nice touch that you can do that. So after switching on and getting a brighter LED glow, we are presented with a brief At Games logo, and we're then straight into a reasonable looking interface. Now I'm not going to lie, I've heard people complain about this interface, and I must admit the navigation is a little clunky to begin with. You have to press B to choose from the menu on the left, and then select games using the D-pad, but it's not going to ruin the show, it took me about 3 minutes to get used to it, and then it works just fine. It's a little strange how they've grouped Mortal Kombat games together and then Sega games. I would have preferred genres and even a split by console type, given we've also got Master System and Game Gear games here, but that's just being picky, I guess. Okay, so let's give Sonic 2 a whirl and check out those response times. On the left we've got Sonic 2 running on an original Mega Drive, and on the right we have the flashback. And yes, there is a very slight delay, in Sonic 2 at least, 
between pressing a button and an action occurring on screen, but really I wouldn't have noticed had I not investigated it so carefully. Using the wireless pad, the delay seems no different to a plugged in controller. The average gamer really isn't going to care though. Given this is emulation, this delay could be slightly worse on some games and slightly better on others, but I've played most of the games on here and for my needs it was just fine. If we stick with Sonic for a bit, I'll explain a few of the features. By pressing either the reset button or the menu button on the wireless pads, we get a menu. From here we can do numerous things, including turning on scan lines, which incidentally look quite nice, but given YouTube compression makes it look terrible, I'll turn it back off. You can also rewind up to 6 seconds of the game at any time by pressing the rewind button on the pads. This allows you to avoid obstacles you didn't avoid, or just watch someone being killed in Mortal Kombat over and over again. Which is glorious. You also get 10 save game slots per game. These are a doddle to use and if you exit a game, you will automatically be asked if you want to load your save game on the next session. This also works for cartridges you load in. Each game's data is held in memory until you next load it up. The selection of games on offer is a bit of a curious one. We're seemingly limited to strictly Sega releases or Mortal Kombat. And that's not bad. We've got a selection of titles such as Sonic, Sonic Spinball, Alien Storm, Bonanza Brothers, Super Thunder Blade, a lot of games I like, and even some RPGs such as Sword of Vermilion. Along with these, there are some Master System classics such as Alex Kidd in Miracle World and Fantasy Zone, and you even get the built-in game Snail Maze from the Mark 1 Master System, which is either a nice touch or they're just scraping the barrel. I can't tell, and I don't really care. Firing up one of the Game Gear titles gives us a nice Game Gear bezel, and actually turning scan lines on here does help create a Game Gear-like experience, just without the horrific motion blur. We also get region exclusives like Golden Axe 3 and games released late in the Mega Drive's life such as Virtua Fighter 2, of which the latter is pretty bad, but never mind because Mortal Kombat 1 through 3 more than make up for it. Plus we actually get the full use of the 6 button pad for once. Once you're bored of all these titles you can of course use your own cartridges. What Nintendo. For this you need to switch off the console, insert your game of choice, turn it back on, whereby the game is loaded entirely into memory, and then you simply click on the game icon under the cartridge section, and you're good to go. Of course this doesn't work with cartridges which contain additional hardware, such as Virtua Racing, or even with the Micro Machines 2 Turbo Tournament J Kart. Nor does it work with the Game Genie or Action Replay nor does it work with the Super Magic Drive, and that's simply because the emulator can't rip a ROM from this kind of device, as they don't contain a conventional ROM. For example, the Super Magic Drive simply acts as a middleman for the ROM, which is contained on floppy disk, and there's a video upcoming on this, by the way. So instead of this nice menu followed by say Universal Soldier loading from disk, the flashback just simply ignores whatever is plugged in and boots normally. Suffice to say the Mega CD of course won't work, neither will the 32X and nor will the Sega Menacer, but of course if you have any of these devices you're also going to be the kind of man or woman who has the original hardware. So let's get back to the core of this machine, the games. Now a cartridge your typical gamer might own is a multi-game cart. Here's that one I got with the Feihao Mega Drive. Usually this contains 18 games accessible from a menu, but interestingly the flashback doesn't load it as a single cartridge, it loads it as multiple ROMs of which you can choose, although it doesn't find all the games on the cartridge. Even Sega's own compilations behave weirdly. Mega Games 6 Volume 3 loads, so we have itself and Revenge of Shinobi ROMs visible, but apart from loading the main menu, none of the titles will actually run. An EverDrive cart won't work at all, just like with the previous At Games hardware. 
Out of curiosity, I tried a single game reproduction cartridge as well, the faithful Dr. Robotnik's Creature Capture, and that worked just fine. I tell you what though, a nice feature would be if these cartridges actually loaded onto the console and you could access them whenever you wanted. But no, you only get the game you've just inserted, anything you've loaded previously is erased. If you want to load in some Master System games, you won't be able to use the original Master System converter, mainly because the cables on the back prevent it from sitting flushly. I would expect it to work with the Sega Master System Converter 2, as it's simply a pass-through connection. However, I've heard it doesn't work with the newer converters such as the Retro Freak Gear Converter, so I'll have to leave that one as a bit of a grey area. Ok, so as with the Fei Hao machine, I want to test Streets of Rage 2 to see how this thing handles sound. Never fails me in these situations. Actually. Why isn't Streets of Rage included on this console? That seems like a huge hole. Anyway, after loading it in, here's the flashback against the original hardware. The sound on the flashback is pretty sharp at parts, that treble feels a bit rattly and piercing, but it's not entirely bad, and we do have actual stereo sound as opposed to the mono output of the Fei Hao machine. The biggest gripe I have is the stuttering throughout, and it doesn't just happen in the title music, you get it throughout the game, although it's less noticeable when you're knee deep in cyberpunks. This actually tallies with the frame drop complaints which have been reported elsewhere. The flashback doesn't always seem to be able to keep up with the Mega Drive emulation in a seamless fashion. Most people won't notice this as it's programmed to simply skip frames rather than actually slow down, but it may upset the hardcore enthusiast. But suffice to say we're only talking the odd couple of frames here and there. You're not going to find yourself appearing somewhere entirely different on the screen. Let's move on to graphics. Now this thing outputs at 720p, just like the SNES Mini, but how does it compare to the original hardware using its RGB output? Well let's use Aladdin for this, mainly because it has nice jagged edges and plain backgrounds which help to show up any artefacts. And as you can see side by side it's actually pretty good. Here we have the Mega Drive's RGB output upscaled to 720p, and there's very little difference between that and the flashback. What's important is the pixel fidelity. And the flashback is actually a bit crisper here, putting out an image you'd expect to see from a typical emulator on your PC. This seems like an appropriate time to also point out that the flashback is of course region free, so no issues like I faced with the Fei Hao clone. Well, apart from Jimmy White's Whirlwind Snooker, which again refuses to load, so you may find the odd game which remains stubborn and defiant. So there we go, it's not overly bad. In fact, my main gripe is the build quality of this thing and the fact that it doesn't feel like a professional quality product. And although that might sound like a silly thing to be concerned about, it actually puts me off playing it. If you take the SNES Mini, then booting it up each time is a pleasurable experience from start to finish. It's something you want to remember, perhaps tell the grandkids. Whereas turning on the flashback is, I don't know, a, a bit like a drunken horror story where you urinated on a passing dog or something, and you just want to forget it. Alright, maybe I'm being a bit harsh, but here's another example. Remember those 85 games I mentioned on the box? Well, they're not all Mega Drive games, nor Master System or Game Gear games. In fact, 19 of them are just random shovelware games which came from god knows where. They're like Flash games. Maybe that's the real reason that this is called The Flashback, hey? <laughs> 
But seriously, it cheapens the experience. I'd rather they left them off and charged us five quid less for the console rather than shoehorning them in under the guise of bonus games or marketing to make it look like it's got more games on the packaging. Maybe they could have spent that fiver hiring some guy from Fiverr.com to fix the interface controls. But, you know, it doesn't matter. Overall, it's not as bad as I'd been led to believe. You get more games than the SNES Mini with the option to load further for the same price. On the downside, the build quality isn't as good, but this is just the route Sega chose. Quantity over quality. It's a shame for us Sega fans, but at least we do have an official product. And it's better than what's come before it. Personally, I'm happy with the original hardware or failing that emulation. But if you want a shiny box on your shelf, then don't be entirely put off by the criticism of this. For the average typical gamer, this thing is just fine. Alternatively, you could just put a Raspberry Pi in a black box. Job done. Thank you all for watching this video. There's some more videos there. You can subscribe if you want to, or even contribute to my Patreon account to keep my channel going and get some rewards. In any case, thank you very much for watching and have a great evening.